92.1 WROI, WROIFM.com. We are streaming audio live on RTC Channel 5 and soon to be audio and video on RTC Channel 4. That's why Elizabeth is here. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. All right. We're going to have our Doc Talk radio show for the month now. And, of course, we feature OBGYN Dr. Eric Seward. Dr. Seward, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, hey, it's another great day. I mean, once a month, here we go, right? Hey, hey once a All month, right. every month. <laughs> and we're talking about... Well, I'm going to talk about screening tests. I want to kind of piggyback on our conversation okay. we were having on Friday. Um, of course, it's Breast Cancer Awareness it is. Month. And uh, we talked a little bit um, uh, on the bank show on Friday about mammograms. Um, and, of course, that is one of the screening tests that we hit hard. Um, as a reminder for those who may not have listened on Friday... Uh, this is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Every, every, October, October, right? every October, we talk um, about getting screening mammograms. And when I talk about screening tests, in general, what I'm, I'm talking about are the things that we do um, as hopefully healthy people to identify potential problems before they become big problems. And so when we talk about screening tests, we're talking about general tests that we're, we're doing to try to either get problems when they're they're small problems or get problems when they're at a preventable point and uh, so oh, a, a lot well, of a wellness type thing if yes could, a right? lot of this is, is okay. exactly that it's wellness um care and and today i'm not gonna I, i'll start talking a little bit about some of the screening tests that are specific to OBGYN, but i'm gonna try to make this pretty broad spectrum because um half of our listeners out there aren't aren't women at all including this guy <laughs> and, and this guy. And this so, guy. <laughs> so there are there are lots of things that we need to be thinking about. But mammograms are something that we are recommending for women. ACOG recommends getting a screening uh, baseline mammogram between 35 and 40. We do every, every year or two, depending on risk profiles, up to 50, and then every year after 50. I mentioned it last Friday that there are different um, recommending groups out there. And so if you get a slightly different version of that from your doctor or if somebody says you don't need to start till you're 50 or if somebody says you only need one every five years until you're 50 they might be right um you know it's it, it depends a little on who you're who you're following what guidelines you're following but um but that said it's breast cancer awareness month get your mammograms okay uh, we talked a little bit about how easy that is to do you don't even need to talk to your doctor really you just call up the radiology department at Woodlawn and they'll get you in. There's but you certainly can do it through your doctor. Sure. Yeah. And there's a requirement too about the insurance companies, right? Well, it's um, it's getting uh, better coverage okay. and the tests are getting better. So we've got better tests, better coverage from an insurance point of view. And most of the things I'm going to talk about today, as long as you stick within reasonable guidelines, are going to be covered. Uh, things get a little bit weird and dicey when you when you hit 65 and it's, and it's purely Medicare. Um, that that has its own set of, of screening test rules, but but for the most part, most insurance companies, including um, Medicare and Medicaid, okay. will will cover most screening tests. Um, now, in my world, and I'm going to kind of categorize this whole talk into first and foremost things that maybe apply to me uh, or my my clientele. Okay. And then I'm going to talk about things that apply to sort of everybody. Then I'm going to end with things that maybe apply to guys. Um, the in my world, you know, one of our main screening tests are going to be Pap smears. In fact, I would argue that when people aren't pregnant, probably and they aren't having a specific problem, probably the number one reason they're coming to see me is to get that Pap smear. Okay. And Pap smear recommendations have have changed over the year. We talked about this at one of our previous programs, but the the bottom line is we start them at age twenty one. Uh, uh, cervical cancer is what we're looking for. Cervical cancer. Uh, if you were to rewind about 50 years, was the number one killer of young women. Um, it was a, a scary cancer that affected women in their 30s. Probably wasn't diagnosed very well, was it? Wasn't diagnosed very well, right. but we have this wonderful screening tool. Um, we know a lot about what causes uh, cervical cancer, and we have a lot of, of evasive maneuvers that we can do to, to try to stave off and prevent problems. And so when it comes to, to screening tests, the pap smear is a, a good one. We recommend starting at age 21 for low risk uh, populations. You'll, you'll get, depending on where you fit into the risk spectrum, um, tests every, you know, anywhere from every two to five years. 
Um, and when when you're in a higher risk uh, uh, profile, then we'll do them every year. Sometimes we'll do those tests along with HPV testing, which is another big part of why um, pap smears and cervical cancers um, issues come up. But that's that's one of the screening tests that I do often. Okay. Another one, uh, not specific for women, but but probably on a 90-10 uh, uh, range um, are what we call DEXA scans. DEXA scans are bone density scans. The DEXA, um, most DEXA scans, there are some office like wrist and ankle x-ray devices that sometimes people will employ. They're sort of like pre-screening screenings, if that makes sense. They don't, they don't have the power to, um, to count as a an official screening test, but DEXA scans look at hip, lower spine, um, measurements of bone density, and they measure those densities against uh, what the average 20-year-old would be, and and assuming that 20-year-olds have nice strong bones, and they they will then rank that based on sort of a standard deviation away from that that strong bone status as we think of it, and if you get outside of a specific uh, range, then there are some risks for for breaking bones if you fall um <coughs> we see these risks go up as as people get older sure, as they get older right and you know there's some pretty devastating um statistics for uh, when people are are 75 or 80 they fall and break a hip um a, 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 there's Not a good. lot of morbidity a lot of mortality that goes yep, along with that that's right best way to prevent all that is to prevent breaking a hip best way to prevent breaking a hip is well, A, don't fall, and B, <laughs> keep your uh, keep your bones relatively strong exactly. and identify those risks. And so that's what a DEXA scan is all about. Um, those are, are primarily um, women screening tests. I will oftentimes do follicle-stimulating and luteinizing hormone tests with my patients when we're trying to question uh, menopausal status. And there are a, a number of reasons why that sometimes comes up. They're not routine screening tests, but they're things I throw out because these are tests that those stimulating hormones from the pituitary gland go up when uh, the end organ, in this case, some um, estrogens and progesterones aren't being made. Okay. So when they're not feeding back, those those levels go up. It's an, a kind of a roundabout way to look at menopausal status, um, especially good when people have had ablations or hysterectomies or things like that. So... Um, <laughs> that said, um, there are a number of general screening tests, and I think one that we think a lot about is cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is not just a, a simple thing, it, and it's not a static thing, but we all, I think most people have heard of cholesterol readings. Um, high cholesterol associated with heart disease. Right. Most of our labs will, will call a borderline cholesterol somewhere in the low 200 range, usually somewhere around 220, 240 and above. They consider that high. Less important is that overall number than, than how its ratio is built around some other things. There's several different stratifications of cholesterol, high density uh, uh, lipoproteins, HDL, LDL are different versions of cholesterol, and then there's also a very low VLDL uh, cholesterol. Well, the HDL is actually protective. It it doesn't cause inflammation or scarring in the lining of the arteries. It actually sucks up some of the low and very that's low. The, that's density. the good guy. That's a good guy. So when you've got a lot of HDL, um, that counteracts uh, some of that LDL. So if you've got a high cholesterol or a borderline cholesterol, but you've got an excellent HDL number, that that sometimes means that you may have a good cholesterol um, and, they, and they look at those ratios and profiles but when we do a cholesterol screen it's usually a a, a comprehensive screen <clears throat> a lot of times if you go to a health fair or um, just sort of an insurance uh, draw um, they may just be doing a, a single number it's nice if you can get that whole panel um, and that's something that i usually start doing for people as a baseline when they hit 40. okay um, I, it's a little more um, online with guys at age 40. With women, you can probably start at age 50. But I, I think it's good information. And it, it, one of those things that if you have a problem, you know there's this potential problem, say, for heart disease, and you can identify it and start to attack it before it's actually created some kind of damage, um, even if you're 25 or 30, if you know you can take cholesterol medicines or, or start taking baby aspirin or something to prevent some of the end product okay. issues, that makes a lot of sense to me. It does. 
Um, thyroid is another one. Now, this probably is, again, maybe 80, 90 percent um, more of a, of a women's problem, but it affects a lot of guys, too. Thyroid is an easy thing to screen for us, a, a relatively easy thing to fix. It's a nice problem. We had a whole conversation on thyroid on this program a few we months did. ago. Um, easy thing to screen. I usually throw it into just sort of standard screening profiles when I'm going to do some blood work. I start at age 40 or when people have symptoms. Um, if somebody has a normal thyroid, normal cholesterol at age 40 or 41 or 42, I probably won't check it again for maybe five years. Okay. Unless something changes in right. their health. Some of my primary care um, colleagues will do more often screenings um, and they may do slightly more comprehensive screenings, which gets me to sort of general labs. Um, general labs are are I think a good thing to know is things like screening for diabetes um, or just or liver issues, kidney issues, all of these internal organs. You can do panels of what we call a complete metabolic profile or you can get electrolyte panels. You can get a blood count to look for um, anemia. And again, a lot of times it's, it's a real easy thing to do when you're going to, if you're going to draw blood for cholesterol, you just sort of send it off for, for the works and sure and then sit down with your your doctor and nurse practitioner and have them go over that with you and explain what all those things are and w what they might mean almost everybody that gets a, a big panel of labs is going to have one that gets flagged as, as borderline or abnormal or something and i every once in a while i have a patient come in and say well why is my you know why is this or that you know flagged and, and usually they're just little like you didn't drink enough water that day or something but um but that's, you know, that's a, a good thing, I think, to get done. I usually start doing that again when people get about 40 um, or if there's an issue. Vitamin D is kind of an interesting one. Uh, there are some big advocates out there for testing vitamin D. It's a fairly easy The sunshine to vitamin, right? It is the sunshine okay. vitamin. Um, it's, it's got um, some important... Um, uh, relationships to bone density and, and it, it sort of helps the whole uh, calcium absorption process but it it is very much it's it's um it's a converted vitamin uh that's converted by the sun okay it's, um, kind of an interesting little phenomenon and uh, people tend to chronically run low in northern climates especially white people in northern climates tend to run low um, there are some people that think it's associated with mood um, so when people have low uh, vitamin D levels, uh, they have other, you know, sort of health and seasonal affective disorders and whatnot. Um, it's not a very easy thing to measure, and the measurements don't, I mean, it, it, I, I back up, it is an easy thing to measure, but it's not an easy thing to interpret. Um, you, can, you can get blood levels of this and, and supplement people on vitamin D. Um, the, the end product of that isn't real clear. Um, I've... I've gone through waves where I've tested people for vitamin D and then it, it always leaves you scratching your head a little bit what to do with the results of that because they all come back low sure. you know? and, and it seems like uh, the vast majority do and, and right. it's hard to, hard to interpret uh, colonoscopies we usually start those at age 50 um, um, in low risk people and in the colonoscopies there's a few different versions of that some of the primary care folks do sigmoidoscopies which is really sort of a, a pared down version of a colonoscopy and they may do those every every five years um, after age 50 the true whole colonoscopy that's usually done over in the hospital and the outpatient surgery center um, those are, are usually every 10 years if they're normal um, looking for polyps or other things that right. might form colon cancers colon cancers number three cancer uh, and it's and it affects men and women equally so um, both need to get in there and get their colonoscopy starting in age okay. 50. Um, guy specific stuff um, uh, and I don't I don't order these labs because I, I don't have these things going <laughs> on but um, Prostate a specific antigen PSA is something that a lot of people screen for um, prostate problems. Um, prostate cancer is the number one cancer in men. Um, it's a very common problem when uh, short of prostate cancer, there's a lot of prostate issues that sometimes can be identified with PSA. Um, testosterone levels are a big one. Again, kind of like vitamin D. Uh, what do you do with a, a low or mid-range testosterone level? At what point do you treat that? Uh, these are great questions for a urologist. Sure. Um, 
but but this is something that's been sort of up and down and hot in uh, sort of the the guy side of things for the last several years. There's definitely a, a drop off in testosterone, sort of middle age, uh, for most most guys, and that tends to go along with the change in sort of lean body um, uh, mass and and a number of other health issues. Um, testosterone is kind of a, a funky. Uh, Hormone in the sense that in some ways it keeps us young and healthy. In other ways, <laughs> it, it probably taxes the all those issues with heart disease. Um, you know, we know that testosterone certainly has a role in sort of male factor balding and in hair growth and in heart disease, et cetera. Um, let, let alone the mental health part of that. <laughs> yeah, and I think and, and so it's one of those things that you just sort of have to you have to kind of work with um, your provider, and, and these are things that are you know it seems like the last time I I saw it the pendulum was sort of swinging away from testosterone supplementation, but um, but I think that there's still you know there's there are things that you can test for with that, and it's probably not a bad idea to to know what your free testosterone is after a certain age. Um, you know, I don't know if they're testing that at forty or fifty. Okay. But, but if you're a guy and you're you're you know, in that middle age or, or older range, it's not a bad idea to get okay. checked, especially if you're having any issues. Um, be one of the first things that somebody with maybe ED might want to to go get checked. Um, EKGs um, aren't necessarily routine screening tests, but heart disease is the number one killer of all people, and um, that's men and women alike. And so if, you know, we tend to focus a lot and, and think a lot about uh, cancer, um, I think we, we, we spend so much time thinking about cancer because it kind of, it's one of those lightning strikes out of left field that scares us, but the vast majority of us um are more affected by heart disease on, on an order of almost two to one. And so probably an everyday conversation yeah. too, the cancer is going to come up more than the heart disease is. It, it, it is. And it's easy to kind of overlook. I think, especially right. in my world, you spend a lot of time talking about, um, the, you know, these screening tests, cancer screening, uh, menopause, et cetera. But, but, you know, I think OBGYNs in general don't spend enough time talking to women about heart disease because we think of that sometimes as being maybe a guy problem. Um, now, EKGs aren't a great screening tool, but we do a lot of them in like pre-op. We do a lot of them in sort of testing rhythms and in heart health. Um, a lot of times we'll do uh, monitors to see if, if there are arrhythmias of any kind. A lot of um, older folks will have um, either atrial arrhythm arrhythmias like fibrillation or things like that that might increase risk for for blood clots and problems so i would have a short fuse depending on circumstances to get um, an ekg or some rhythm strip to look at heart health um, in a number of my patients and one might consider that to be sort of a borderline screening even though it's not something that we routinely do um, I guess along those lines, too, I'd, I'd throw a plug in for probably most guys um, after the age of 40, if you've got risk, um, after the age of 30, maybe, um, and most women after the age of 50 probably ought to be taking uh, baby aspirin supplements. Um, again, there's, there's all kinds of ups and downs and pendulum swings and what the general recommendations are for health, and this is one that's, that's not been immune to that, but... I think for at least the last 30 years, that's been the general recommendation. Most of the last 30 years, uh, taking a baby aspirin to help stave off heart okay. disease. Um, and while that's not a test, it's just sort of a right. PSA uh, um, shot for basically both men and Probably women. one of those things that won't do you any harm. Right, right, and I, I'll tell you this too. Um, I'm an OBGYN, and so I deal with my little right. my little narrow set of problems. But um, you know, we've got a number of wonderful primary care doctors out in the community, and they are dealing with um, sort of a broader range of issues. They're dealing with some of these guy issues and and some of the sort of cutting edge issues and some of the tests that may, you know, may be on the horizon. Um, we've been talking about you know genetic testing for for you know, 20, 30 years right. now. Ever since the Clinton administration, basically. Ever since, yeah, yeah, well, you can get into the politics of that, but you could also say that, um, you know, in the meantime, we've mapped the entire human genome, and there's a there are ways that um, 
that we can address or at least identify a whole lot of different risks. They haven't gone mainstream yet, and the treatments for those haven't gone mainstream yet, and there's a lot of controversy about that. But, um, but it, you know, we keep talking about how someday these are going to be probably, the, that's, that's the next wave of identification and screenings is to know what your specific genetic risks are and then sort of, um, you know, identify ways to maybe mitigate some of those issues. Okay. For now, we, we have to kind of go with the uh, general odds, <laughs> but but that's what screening tests basically right. are designed to do. They're designed to, you know, find problems before they're problems and, or very early on so that hopefully, you know, a, a, a little breast cancer is easier to treat than a big one. Just a plug as we kind of ramp this up for the Woodlawn Portal, too. If you're a client or a patient of Woodlawn Hospital or the clinic yep. or somewhere in the yep. system, the portal is a good thing to sign into to get your specific medical information, right? It, it, it absolutely is. And in fact, um, and, and there's a number of levels of this. With the Affordable Health Care Act, there was, um, there was sort of a drive to get everybody um, onto EMRs, which are electronic medical systems. But one of the, the ways that we are judged on those is by the, the percentages of folks that we have that are using their portals. Um, not to say that, that that it's all about us getting judged, right. but it's um, people should have access right. to and should be They're aware right. of sure. and should be following sure. up on these things. It doesn't do me much good to do a lab on somebody and then not have any kind of <laughs> feedback right. or follow-up to right. that. You know, and a lot of times that's, I think, what happens when things are normal. Right. Uh, people just sort of lose track of it. They, they The old um, notion that no news is good news is, is sort of bad bad medicine so to speak <laughs> um or or just a bad policy for personal understanding of your own health issues you know I'm dr eric saying. seward our guest this morning on doc talk radio dr seward yeah. folks who would like to follow up with you and uh maybe talk with you more in depth how do they get a hold of you hey i'm over at the uh the woodlawn uh, medical professionals clinic we like to think of ourselves as wimps WMPS, <laughs> um, but I'm right there in the uh, the second uh, floor of the, um, I guess it would be the east end of the hospital. Okay. And uh, you can call up there and, and get appointments or, or we're happy to see anybody. Any thoughts about next month? Oh, gosh, I, I have a whole list of topics. <laughs> and uh, what I usually do is I throw out... Um, to all of my uh, my my friends and relatives and work coworkers, uh, what do you guys want to hear about? Um, I haven't gotten any feedback here recently, <laughs> so I'll I'll go back at it. Anything you want to hear about? <laughs> uh, we'll uh, we'll talk. Okay, we'll talk right. over the next few weeks. So we come up with. We'll come up with something. Doctor Seward is always. <laughs> there's, there's Thank lots. you very much. Thanks.